Alrighty guys, don't forget your initial acquisition when you buy PP&E, not only do you have your historical costs, so your historical costs can consist of things as the cash paid, it could also be fair market value of stock issued, fair market value of property issued, and or fair market value of debt if you borrow money, but you have your historical costs. Okay, and then it also includes all of those expenditures to get that asset ready for its intended use. Now we again, I covered earlier, IFRS, you have an option, you could use the cost model like US gap or the revaluation model which we'll see later now first thing I want to remind you guys of is that when you buy PP&E don't just settle on the purchase price if it's land look for things like title and recording fees attorneys fees maybe you got to remove an old building that's part of the cost of the land clearing the land that's part of the cost of the land if you pick up any delinquent taxes that's cost of the land okay the cost of the building really starts with what when you start excavating okay then the cost of the building kicks in but if it's land it's beyond just the purchase prices we mentioned journal entry for the purchase of land so you're going to debit your land and either credit cash or payable okay but that's generally our journal entry and don't forget when you buy land that's an investing outflow okay now what happens guys if a new fence is needed on our farm now as if I've ever been on a farm right but we had farms where I grew up in Mississippi they want to know how is this accounted for well remember land improvements whether it's a fence a private road a water system a sidewalk all that stuff you're gonna have to include the cost but it's got to be recorded as a separate asset. Why is that? Because those land improvements are subject to being depreciated and the land itself is not depreciated. So the land improvements has its own separate category. So if you have any of these land improvements, okay, a fence, a road, a water system, whatever it is, you're going to debit land improvements and then credit your cash or payable whatever it may be okay guys now don't forget if you buy equipment just like with land it's not just your invoice your purchase price so when you acquire equipment not only is it the purchase price but if you pay any taxes installation testing freight trial run whatever anything to get that equipment ready for its intended use all of those costs get capitalized what's your journal entry when you purchase equipment you'll debit the equipment and then either credit cash or payable and remember that's going to be an investing outflow so whether you buy land or equipment that's going to be investing outflow okay guys if we should improve the equipment I'm not talking about ordinary repairs and maintenance ordinary repairs and maintenance we know that gets expense but should you improve the equipment that's a little bit different than improving land when you improve land we mentioned just a second ago that has its own separate account because that's subject to depreciation when the land itself is not we don't need to do that though when you have an improvement to the equipment okay so equipment improvement you can simply debit the equipment okay so for the equipment because that is subject to being depreciated you can just go ahead and put that up in the equipment account okay now should you have ordinary repairs or maintenance we know the deal you'll debit your expense you'll credit your cash or accounts payable some kind of ordinary repair or maintenance don't confuse that though with something that's extraordinary okay ordinary repairs all right they'll you know they'll probably use the word ordinary or regular maintenance or something to that effect an extraordinary repair they might call it that or maybe use the word addition or improvement something that extends the useful life or improves the uh, utility of the asset so when it's something extraordinary in addition to improvement then you go ahead and debit the equipment credit your cash or your payable okay now we know if we buy we have a basket purchase land and building we know we have to segregate the cost of the land and the cost of the building because the land is not subject to depreciation but the building is when you buy a building just like buying land it's not just the purchase price you'll have attorney's fees maybe there were repair charges neglected by the previous owner and you've got to pay for that then that'll be part of the cost of the building okay reconditioning costs commissions okay all of that stuff our journal entry would be when we buy the building debit at the building credit the cash and then the building again is subject to depreciation if there's that basket purchase guys they got to give you some kind of ratio of appraised values okay or will create a ratio based upon the appraised value of the land versus the building this way we know how much to debit to the building account versus how much we debit to the land account okay now sometimes guys we're not going to purchase a building instead we might construct that fixed asset ourselves so whether it's a warehouse and 
office building, a factory, and whether we're gonna use it for ourselves or we're gonna resell it, there's a big difference when you construct a building and whenever you construct that building, obviously you know the materials, the labor, the overhead, but the big issue is the interest costs. If you borrow money to finance the construction of a non-current asset a building, the interest during the term of construction, that's eligible to be capitalized, but you gotta make sure it's during the term of construction, not before and not after it ends. Normally the construction begins, you file your permits, things of that nature, you hire the architect, and then they'll tell you when the construction period ends, but you can only capitalize the interest during the term of construction. Now that's a, an exception to the general rule. Normally we expense our interest as incurred, but not when it's capitalized because we're constructing a building and we have construction loans. Okay, now the question becomes, how do you calculate that capitalized interest. You've got to find for me your average accumulated expenditures and then multiply that by whatever interest rate they give you and that is your capitalized interest. Sometimes, don't forget on the exam, uh, you know, you need to know capitalized interest is also sometimes called avoidable interest because we're deferring the cost to the future. We're adding it to the cost of the building. So whether they call it capitalized interest or avoidable interest, that portion during the term of construction gets added to the building, okay? And remember, the avoidable or the capitalized interest can never exceed the total interest costs actually incurred that period. So the total interest costs incurred that period, well, that's your cap. You can't capitalize more than that. Okay, guys, here are our facts. I'll walk you through it. Farmland Firm has decided to start construction for a building needed for agricultural departments. So if I'm taking the exam, the first thing that jumps out at me, I'm constructing a building. So I'm thinking about capitalizing my materials, labor, overhead, and my construction interest during the term of construction. Okay, I'll capitalize that interest. On January 1, the firm took out a $400,000 loan at 10%. Now look, that's a specific construction loan. So as we take out money and use it for construction, the first portion of that money is gonna come from this construction loan, the 400,000, and the interest rate there is 10%. The firm, by the way, also had an existing loan of 800,000. So if we have expenditures in excess of 400,000, then what are we gonna start taking from? That existing loan that has a separate interest rate of 8%. That's called the general debt. Now remember, you can only capitalize the interest not on what you borrow, but the accumulated expenditures. So watch how this works. So now they tell us the expenditures for the new building. Well, on January 1, $200,000. Now look, that's outstanding all 12 months. So when we calculate our weighted average expenditures, that $200,000, outstanding all 12 months. Why? Because we incurred that cost, spent the money right there on January 1. Okay, the next thing we have, July 1. On July 1, we spent $300,000. Now look, that's only going to be outstanding for half the year from July 1 through December 31st. So that'll be only six months. And then on October 1st, we spent another $600,000. Obviously, that's only outstanding for three months, October, November, December. Okay, guys, so now if you look at our solution, step number one, let's find our weighted average expenditures. So 200,000 times 12 over 12, 300,000 times 6 over 12, 600,000 times 3 over 12, add it all up. What are our weighted average expenditures? A half a million dollars, 500,000. Now, where's that $500,000 gonna come from? The first 400,000 is gonna come from where? The construction loan, which has a rate of 10%. The other 100,000, the excess over 400 will come from the general debt, and that has an interest rate, obviously, of 8%. Okay, now, our next step, three. Let's determine two things. First of all, our actual interest, and then our avoidable interest. Now look, your actual interest is not based upon what you spent. Your actual interest is based upon what you borrowed, okay? So the lender doesn't care if you use their money or not. You borrow the money, you're paying interest on it. So the actual interest on the construction loan, 400,000 times 10%, and on the general debt, 800,000 times 8%. Okay, so $104,000 is our total interest, our actual interest incurred that period. Now, I want to take that 104,000 and segregate it. How much of that can be capitalized? And then whatever can't be capitalized has to be expensed. So the next step is I'll calculate my avoidable interest. Okay, we had $500,000 of weighted average expenditures. The first $400,000 comes from the construction loan at 10%. That's $40,000. Then the next $100,000 comes from the general debt at 8%. That's $8,000. So add the forty dollars and the eight, you get $48,000. So of that $104,000 of actual interest incurred, $48,000 can 
can be capitalized. So that's going to be going on the balance sheet as part of the cost of the building. So anything above and beyond that 48, the other 56,000, 104 minus 48, the other 56,000 of interest has got to be expensed. Okay, so when we record our journal entries as we're constructing that building, you ready? So going back to the facts, on January 1, we spent $200,000. Materials, labor, I don't know, but we spent $200,000. So debit the building, credit the cash, $200,000. On July 1, we spent another $300,000. Materials, labor, I don't know, but we spent another $300,000 per the fax, debit building, credit cash, $300,000. October 1, we spent another $600,000. Debit the building, credit the cash, $600,000. The key to getting this right on the exam is the journal entry that's the least obvious on December 31st, the interest that we're going to capitalize. So on December 31st, I'm going to have two debits. The first one is to the building for the capitalized interest of $48,000. Then I'm going to have my interest expense that I can't capitalize, $56,000. So two debits, one to the building for the capitalized interest of $48,000, the other debit to interest expense for $56,000. Your credit to cash or interest payable, whatever the case may be, is going to be for the $104,000 of actual interest. So really, that's an excellent example, all right, of all the sequence of events. So if you construct a building, whether it's for use in the business or for somebody else during the term of that construction, not before, not after, you could capitalize that interest, but you're capitalizing interest on the money actually spent, not what's borrowed, okay? So if you could work that, man, you're in good shape. All righty, let's move on.